the night of January 19th, of course, is the famous inaugural balls. There are a bunch of inaugural balls around D.C. And uh, so I get my tuxedo on, go to an inaugural ball, and I get a message, uh, probably a BlackBerry message, saying, go to this random address in D.C. and pick up a package. <laughs> this, this, sounds like, uh, this sounds like this may be a, a foreign operation. That, that is totally, like, right? Like, it, it's it, like, you're looking for Jason Bourne, not me, right? right? an organization called Protect Democracy. Uh, it has a profound mission, but this conversation is really about the lessons that leaders of all sorts of organizations, for-profits, not-for-profits, government entities, whatever it might be, but what they can learn from what you've done building this organization. I'd love to hear just a little bit about your journey, how, how you ended up in law school and how you ended up on, on this path to protecting American democracy. You know, it's a journey that goes all the way back probably to, to, to childhood. Um, and, you know, I think having an early instinct that the way that we made decisions in our society for how to split the pie, how to allocate resources, what to value, just didn't seem to be as optimal as they could be. And, and I didn't really have a hand in it until I got to college uh, around 1994, which was the year that the new Republican majority led by Newt Gingrich um, brought the contract with America to the country. And one pillar of it was to cut federal student aid uh, the greatest amount since the GI Bill, and I was I was a you know I was certainly privileged growing up, but I still benefited from federal student loans to go to school. And I had a younger brother who wouldn't have been able to follow the same path I had if if those cuts had gone through. And so, uh, several friends and I began organizing across college campuses around the country to protect those student aid cuts. And it was the first time that I felt a sense of you know, we all as citizens can play a role in shaping the destiny of the country. And I, I kind of got the bug. And, and that, that set me on a path of wanting to be involved in how we make decisions about how to guide our society and, and lift up everybody, really. So there, there are a lot of paths one can take uh, if they want to go in that direction. You chose to go to law school. What, what, what led you to the decision to go to law school? Well, I first was going to be a journalist. But when I started doing that political organizing, we started working with our local member of Congress, with the minority leader in the House, who was Dick Gephardt at the time. And I got that bug of being involved in, in sort of government and politics. I decided to add a political theory major. And I, I tried my hand at each after undergrad. I, I covered the war in Kosovo, uh, the NATO bombing there. I was there in Pristina in the summer of 99. Um, and I was, I think I was going to pursue the journalism path. Uh, and I was actually at a small little uh, magazine uh, covering music. And I ended up at a, at a club at about five o'clock on a Wednesday because some music PR agent enticed me to go see a band. And it was like me, the band's girlfriends, and this one old guy at the bar who's probably in his 60s or 70s looked like David Frick, you know, sort of the Keith Richards looking journalist at Rolling Stone. And I thought, I'm going to end up like <laughs> one day looking across. I went home and I said to my roommate at the time, I said, I think I'm going to go to law school. And, and I applied that night. What happens for you in law school? Where, where did you go and, and what did you experience there? So I went to a, a good law school, George Washington, D.C. I wanted to be in D.C. in the heart of where politics happens. And, and then luck played a role in that I ended up taking my first year property law class and being an assistant for a professor who said to me one day that his third year mentor from when he was a law student at Harvard University in the Black Law Students Association was running for Senate in Illinois. And although it was not a requirement of me being his research assistant, he thought he knew my politics and he thought I might be interested in his former mentor. And so I said, sure, you know, who, who, what's his name? And he said, you know, Barack Obama, uh, who was an unknown person at the time. And I, you know, got involved then and, and that was serendipity. What did you do on the campaign? I was in the policy team. Then Senator Obama becomes president-elect Obama. And do you immediately get a job in the administration? Do you, do you, do you know what you're going to go do? I wish. I managed to get a job on the transition. And then it, we're approaching Inauguration Day, and I don't have a job in the administration yet. And I knew I wanted to work in the White House Counsel's Office, which was an incredibly difficult role to get. And uh, January 17th, 18th, I think, rolls around of 2009. We're about two or three days before Inauguration. I still don't have a job. Um, and so about, I think it was probably like two, three in the morning, I decided to throw a Hail Mary. You know, I wrote this long thing. It was sort of desperate. It was a plea. It was all the reasons why I wanted to do it, everything that I'd done to get there. And I just hit send at three in the morning and went to sleep. The first thing was I go, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> what on earth did I write and send last night? And I opened my, my email, probably on like a Blackberry back then or something. And uh, there's an email from Greg Craig's assistant saying he wants to see you for an interview today. And uh, I got the offer. I think it was probably that night. 
Um, and I went in to the building on January 20th, 2009 with the, the well, new administration. Is there any prep for this job? Do they, do they give you any context for what you're doing? Or do you just walk in on day one and say, I guess I'm working for the president? So I get the job, I think, uh, January 18th, right? The inauguration is January 20th. The next day, January 19th, I think I'm put in touch with Norm. I'm, I'm going to get this portfolio. And the night of January 19th, of course, is the famous inaugural balls. There are a bunch of inaugural balls around D.C. And uh, so I get my tuxedo on, go to an inaugural ball, and I get a message. Uh, probably a BlackBerry message saying, go to this random address in DC and pick up a package. This, this sounds like uh, this sounds like this may be a, a foreign operation. That, that is, totally it, right. Like it, it's it, like you, you're looking for Jason Bourne, not me. Right. right. So I duck out of the ball. It's raining that night. I run across the district in the rain, and I get to this the building, the designated address, and there's a doorman who hands me a plastic grocery bag bursting at the seams with three thick binders, like school binders, right? And um, I bring them home that night, and they contained memos going back to the Eisenhower administration that White House counsels and chiefs of staff had sent to White House staff and executive branch officials explaining the rules, explaining what people were allowed to do and were not allowed to do in the performance of their duties. And what was striking about it and became you know, so clear over the next three years where these binders became my Bible was that a lot of these rules are not legally binding. They were just traditions. They were customs that were passed down from administration to administration. And when people in the White House had questions about what was allowed, I'd consult the binders. And if they didn't contain the answer, I called Emmett Flood, who did my job for President Bush. And if Emmett and I couldn't answer it, we called Beth Nolan, who did it for President Clinton. And it didn't matter whether we were working for a Democratic president or Republican president. The rules were consistent for over decades. And that was another part of the sort of awe of what we'd been able to pull off as a country. Um, but it also becomes relevant later on in terms of both how amazing it is that we've been able to do that and hand those rules off and also how fragile it is. And, and what, what did you learn from that experience of being able to work with your predecessors who'd worked for different administrations, presidents of different parties? The thing that was so striking was that what happens there is everyone understands from the president on down that we are temporary occupants of an office. We hold an incredibly precious and valuable public trust that we, the people, the citizens, give to us temporarily only on the condition that we will exercise it in their best interest, on their behalf. And it was part of my job to drill that into, you know, the minds and, and the hearts and, the, and the, the just sort of every way that everyone operated in the building and in the executive branch. And that, that really did, you know, for the most part, uh, transcend uh, parties and administrations. So Ian, you, you spent about three years in the White House You'd been a music journalist. You'd been a, a free policy worker on a campaign. Um, you'd worked in the White House where the, the pay is not what is in the private sector. Um, the obvious thing to do at that point is, is to go work at a law firm and cash in a big check. And is, is that what you decided to do or did you go in another direction? I ended up going to a nonprofit organization that did global organizing on protecting the environment and human rights and freedom and democracy, a really interesting group called Avaz. Um, and it was a, it was a wild eye-opening experience, not so much for the substance of the work. The substance of the work was fascinating. We worked with, you know, um, young Syrian freedom activists in the, in the Arab spring, trying to help them against the incredibly brutal regime that ultimately put down that freedom movement. Um, did a lot of work to, to try to advance climate change, uh, response policy. But the thing that was, you know, for me, the most eye-opening was, was not the substance of the work, which was fascinating and, and meaningful and important. It was how it was done. It was read by, led by a management savant uh, in, in how to think about intentional culture in a workplace that built the culture from the ground up from the beginning as the DNA of the organization and wove it into everything the organization did, how it tested in hiring, how it onboarded and trained people to operate within the organization, how it in, sort of um, injected that culture into every team meeting, into every interaction, so that ultimately, as the organization scaled, that DNA replicated. And even if the organization grew to be, you know, a thousand, 10,000, however big you wanted to be, in every meeting, even if the original team was not present, you could sort of assume that the way the people in that meeting would approach the problem would carry with it these sort of core principles. I then was at, I was at a nonprofit that we, we 
we tried to do something like that, but we didn't weave culture into everything. And so what ended up happening was culture became kind of those principles on the wall or like on the website. Say, so, do you have values? Do you have, yeah, yeah, we got a set of values. They're, look on the website or look on the wall. But if you tapped anyone on the shoulder in the middle of a workday and said, you know, name the values of the organization, they couldn't recite them. And certainly if you said, when was the last time that you invoked them with a colleague in the course of your work? Never, right? And so it was like a human A-B test for me. I was in two different organizations seeing what it was like to do intentional culture and seeing what it was like to put cultural principles on a wall. And nothing could have been more powerful at proving the importance of doing that. And so when we ultimately, when we start Protect Democracy, um, my, my, my co-founder and I start, we, we had a concept note. And I said to him, along with the concept note, we got to write out the culture principles. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, trust me, this, is, this has got to be baked in from the DNA from the beginning along with what it is that we're trying to do. So set the stage for us on, on that. Um, uh, the 2016 election happens. Um, you wake up the next morning. Where are you and where does this, this initial idea for Protect Democracy take root? I was in voter protection headquarters in Philadelphia in this law office. It was sort of a, a box, empty box on the floor. So I wound up to sort of kick the empty box, cardboard box, you know, into the wall um, and it wasn't empty. And so the box didn't budge uh, and I broke my foot. So I wake up the next morning with my broken foot and there's an email from a friend and former partner in, in other projects who had also been in the White House Counsel's Office a little after me by the name of Justin Florence. And the email said, um, should we get the White House Counsel alumni together and talk about what's coming and, and whether there's something we can do about it? And I think that the, the insight and what was behind that email was that all those binders that I talked about, all those kind of unwritten laws, all the ways in which presidents of both parties had understood that there were restraints on their office and on themselves and that they held a public trust that we recognize that with the the election in 2016, something fundamentally different was about to happen. And so the question was, what would happen if someone threw out those binders and said, these rules are for suckers? There are a lot of other places where people can go to learn about the work of Protect Democracy. and But for, for this conversation, I really want to focus on how you built the organization uh, and how you've scaled it since 2017. So you start with a concept note, uh, cultural principles, and a partner in Justin Florence. How does it go from that to actually being an organization that's funded and beginning to operate? What's what's the arc for you that that, that might be similar to an arc for an early stage entrepreneur launching, launching their company? We had a very clear mission statement from the get-go, which was prevent American democracy from declining into a more authoritarian form of government. But the actual products we were going to need to create, whether we were going to ship DVDs or stream digital content, was a little bit TBD. And so underscoring the importance of we had to build a pretty nimble company, you know, from the beginning. And so there was an element of like, how do you build a strong company? The culture principles were really important. Having, you know, the top talent was really important. Um, but there was also, so we had some philosophical ideas about how to do this. But then there was also sort of the practical, you know, what do you, I got a broken foot, I got a laptop, what do you do? And I think in that way, we were in a similar situation to a lot of founders, which was, you know, we needed a budget. So, you know, we did the concept note, we did the the culture principles, um, we did, uh, you know, we did this sort of budget, and then we kind of, then it just sort of petered, right? Um, because to start something new, to start a new company, takes a lot of chutzpah, confidence, even arrogance. And frankly, we just didn't have enough of it. And, um, you know, at the time, not only did I have a broken foot, but I had my first child uh, due in two months. So this notion of like, are you going to start something new? I had, a, I had a good job at another really wonderful nonprofit at the time called Give Directly. Um, we just didn't have that oomph to get over that hump that I'm sure a lot of, a lot of founders know that moment. And, and then I got a call uh, about two or three weeks after the election from two other um, uh, former members of the White House Counsel's Office, I'd worked with Karen Dunn and Blake Roberts, and they said that there had been a meeting in Washington, D.C. that day of a lot of kind of leading lawyers in the district, people who had led the Department of Justice, also had been in the White House Counsel's Office, and that there was a discussion that there was a need for a new organization given the moment we were in, and my name was floated as someone who should lead it, and everybody agreed. And Karen and Blake were deputized to call me and recruit me into it. And you know, there's 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 those few moments in your life that you'll just sort of never forget where you were and how it felt. And like the, it was flattering, it was humbling. Um, but I think importantly, it was confidence building. And then I think the other really key thing is it was expectation settings. And um, 
And then another really important lesson kicked in at that moment, which was that when I'd gone into the White House Counsel's office at the beginning of the Obama administration, I was a baby lawyer. And I remember thinking, I don't know uh, how this job works. I don't know how the, the government works. And I should sit and listen. And I should, st- and I would go into every meeting and I would pick the seat on the furthest outskirts of the room, right? Against the wall, not at the center table. And so, and, and because it was my job to sort of learn and listen and be a, a baby lawyer. And, um, and I realized very quickly that if, if you behave like a wallflower, people will treat you like one. And two of my other colleagues, Karen Dunn and Danielle Gray, were kind of the same vintage lawyer I was. But when they walked into a room, they sat at the head of the table. And so people, people treated them like they led the meeting. And that's not a, the lesson I took away was not to, and, and Karen and, and Danielle were not arrogant or power hungry, or any of those things, but they acted like they belonged. And I took, and, and they took control. They seized the moment. And I remember at that moment where, where Karen and Blake and I were on the phone, I said, let's do a meeting with everybody who was in DC at that meeting you know, earlier today. Let's do it tomorrow. And I remember saying to myself, when you get on that call, you take charge. You sit at the head of the room. It was, it was on a phone call. You sit at the head of the room and you tell everyone what we're going to do. And you listen, but you definitely lead. And yeah. so as, as you saw that market opportunity and you had the confidence, you had the concept note, you had the cultural uh, principles, you had the support of the, the DC legal establishment, you had a founding partner, you raised some capital, um, you also made a critical early decision, which was not to have a headquarters where all or most of the, the team members would sit. Talk about the decision to build a, a distributed organization years before we even knew what COVID was, and then how you managed to do that and keep the culture strong. Yeah, I mean, well, there was a, there was a, a reason for that that was unique to what we were building, and then I think there, there are reasons for that that are actually generally applicable to any organization. Um, so the unique one was that we were so invested in having this very intentional, healthy culture. And if you want to have the kind of healthy culture they were building that had, you know, our culture principles are, you know, mission is the metric. That's number one. Every decision you make in the organization, the decision frame is what is best going to advance our mission of preventing American democracy from declining into a more authoritarian form of government. Now, that may sound kind of obvious, right? Of course, your organization should do what it's intended to do. But you, you, you'd be surprised when you think about, think about meetings that you've been in where the decision frame is influenced also by like, well, what's the media going to think? Or what are the investors going to think? Or what's good for my career? What's good for my personal brand? And like, let me tell you, that thinking is everywhere in Washington, D.C., right? What's good for me, right? Um, And so, you know, other other principles that we had, work-life balance is a professional responsibility because the social science is very clear that if you work your staff 14, 15 hours a day, they're going to be less innovative, less creative. They're going to make more mistakes. They're going to burn out. You're going to have a higher turnover rate. That's going to be costly to your organization. So, and that's also the, the general mode of operating in a place like Washington. So we understood that if we wanted to build this culture in the more obvious place that an organization like this would start in Washington, D.C., we would be swimming upstream against the dominant culture of the town. So we had a very specific reason, which is we did not want to be rooted in Washington, D.C. to do this. And American democracy doesn't just exist in Washington, D.C. That's part of the problem. It exists all over the country. We needed to be rooted all over the country. We needed the wisdom of, of of the full nation. But the second reason, which I think is generally applicable, is there are a lot of advantages to having a distributed remote organization. Number one, talent, which is talent lives all over the place. The other is, um, in addition to the benefits for us of not being rooted in D.C., I think generally it's true that if you're a distributed organization, you have a little bit more control over, one, maximizing the efficiency of the work and maximizing the ability to control your culture. Um, If everybody is in a physical setting together, there's less efficiency because there's a lot of, you know, I'm really in my flow, I'm in my groove, and someone comes to my desk and they want to talk to me, and they're at a moment where they really want to talk, but I'm in a moment where I really want to work, but now I feel kind of obligated to talk to them because they're standing right there. So there's a lot of inefficiency in terms of people having to switch constantly to sort of engage, whereas you're able to control that more when you're off, you know, sort of in your own places in a distributed way. Okay, I want culture. I, 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 I... I want, yeah. to, I want to pause you there, Ian, because um, this is something I struggle with and, and, and a lot of my friends who lead teams are struggling with because 
we we grew up in cultures where we sat on that on that back bench and we got to watch and see how it was done. And after the meeting, we got to take a walk with a colleague and debrief and understand why they made this choice or that choice and start figuring out what what might work for me that that works for them or what I would do differently. Um, I, I, it's really hard when you're when you're when you're doing your meetings over Zoom or phone calls to then get that time, to get that texture, to get that inter- those interstitial moments of, of learning and mentoring and growth. So in, in a fully distributed organization, how have you done this so successfully? Well, you have to do all of those things, right? All those things are absolutely essential. The thing about a fully distributed organization is you do them all super intentionally. You're able to craft intentional spaces to do all of those things, right? So first off, right, you have to have the deep rapport between coworkers, the deep trust between coworkers, so that in a really heated moment where someone says something that like comes off the wrong way, the other person doesn't all of a sudden get really upset about it and then get angry and then they get a fight and then the manager's got to come in and sort it out. And that's all that takes away an enormous amount of time and energy from everybody, lowers morale, it's inefficient. Um, so you got to build that rapport. So we do that really intentionally, right? If you have a distributed organization, we do anyone who joins the organization. Um, they're going to do. They're going to have a very intentional onboarding boot camp of several days with their cohort coming in, and then they're going to do one-on-ones with everybody in the organization. And in these one-on-ones, we tell them it's really important. Don't don't share your resume. People can read that online, right? Um, you, you don't tell them what you're what you're working on right now. You got to have the courage to go into those meetings and say, Jeff, what makes you tick? All right, you face an additional challenge uh, from many organizations because. You, you say that the mission is the metric, and I want to I want to understand that on a deeper level. But you've also assembled a team of people who have worked for everyone from uh, Elizabeth Warren to Ted Cruz and Jim Dement and John McCain. Um, h- how have you created a culture where people with such radically different mm-hmm. political belief systems, political philosophies on so many issues, um, can come together and and focus in on the single mission so well? Well, first off, we have to do this as a country, right? Um, this is we're, if we can't, in an organization committed to protecting democracy, bring people together across political differences. How do we expect the country to be able to do it? And there are those things that are necessary and fundamental for a country to be democratic. You have to be able. Look what's happening in Russia right now. Uh, you know, the regime. First off, they kill Alexei Navalny, right? The the the, the leading opponent to the autocratic leader. And then people are not even allowed to come out and lay flowers as a, in order to publicly grieve without being brutally arrested by the regime's forces. That is not consistent with healthy democracy. That is, that is below the baseline of what's required. And so first off, we're able to bring people together who disagree, but we agree on the fundamental values of democracy. And you know, we also have to build a culture that respects those differences. And that is a culture of curiosity and a culture of cherishing feedback and a culture of humility and being willing to learn and listen to one another. How do you think about both competing with and cooperating with other entities that are focused on the same mission that Protect Democracy is? Um, well, well, we have a word for it. Um, we call it cooperation, which is one of the unique dynamics of the nonprofit sector. In the for-profit sector, it is assumed that companies will compete against each other. It is considered a good, a necessity, because as they compete, they force each other to out-innovate one another, and the entire sector moves forward. And the assumption in the nonprofit sector is that um, we should all just be cooperating with each other, and that and you'll hear this a lot from, from investors, from donors, saying, well, are you guys duplicative of each other? Aren't you guys doing sort of the same thing? And, and why can't you sort of get together and do it together? And, you know, My response is, well, you do want us to cooperate with each other. If we develop a innovative strategy to advance the ball of our democracy, we should share it with the entire sector. We do that in the nonprofit space. It's really important because we do have a shared mission. At the same time, the notion that we should collapse all of the entities in the nonprofit space and just have one and not, no duplication, you'd eliminate competition, you'd eliminate innovation, you'd actually create a less good customer experience and less advances. You want a little bit of competition because I will tell you the truth is because we as an organization have to compete for donors, we have to compete for talent, we have to compete for media attention, we have to compete for meetings with legislators, that drives us to do better. And so the nonprofit space has to compete and it has to cooperate, it has to it has to have cooperation. 
W one of the other uh, interesting um, points of commonality between for-profits and not-for-profits is success on mission tends to buoy or depress spirits. I'd love to hear, one, where you are on mission, and two, um, how you keep the team's spirits buoyed when they're concerned that they're not achieving mission. You know, it, it all rests upon that cultural foundation we talked about earlier, but there are moments that I have my doubts, as everyone on the team does, and I remember one of them came in the fall of 2020 as we were approaching the election, and as an optimist, I generally think that it is more likely than not that we will end up in a better place in the future. And I had dipped into a place where I thought it was actually only a 49% chance that we would end up in a better place and that more likely than not, we would end up in a very dark place. Um, and I remember I, I reached out to a mentor of mine and I said, how do I lead a team if I actually have dipped into that place of pessimism? And he said to me, you may think there's only a 49% chance of success, but do you believe that you and your team and the American people have the agency to add that 2%, to tip us back to 51? Is that within your control to do? And I remember thinking, absolutely. We absolutely have that agency. He said, then lead from there. And I bring that to the team and I encourage the team to think that way as well, which is that authoritarianism thrives on hopelessness, on despair on a feeling of isolation and that nothing can possibly get better. And democracy as a form of government isn't just a set of laws or amendments in a constitution. Alexis de Tocqueville referred to the habits of the heart in America that make us a democratic society. It is what we carry with us every day and what we do. It is that belief that we have the agency to chart our own future, that we the people will set our own destiny. And so even in a moment when members on our team or listeners to this podcast think, I actually think we're trending towards a dark place, keep in mind that both the right way to think instrumentally to get there and the truth is that we have the agency to change that outcome. And if you actually embody that spirit, then you're living as a small d Democrat in a democratic country to give us the hope we need to actually get to that promised land. I love that. And and I love what I'm going to start referring to as the 2% principle. Uh, because this idea that, boy, if you're just on, on the wrong side of that optimism, pessimism line, if you and your team really believe that you can tip that scale just that small amount, you don't have to get it to 100%. You just have to get it to 51% to really believe and get back on the horse and, and ride into battle. Um, I think that's an extraordinary lesson and, and uh, principle for us to take into our workplaces, not for profit, for profit or other. So thank you, Ian. I'm grateful for that insight, for those lessons and for your time today. It's always good talking to you, Jeff.